Right, good afternoon. Welcome to CSIS. It's our uh, enormous uh, honor and pleasure to have the Australian Foreign Minister Julia Bishop speak to us today. <clears throat> um, I'm Michael Green, the Senior Vice President for Asia uh, at CSIS, and uh, it's my responsibility uh, before we begin to read you um, our safety procedures, uh, something we, um, we do now regularly. We uh, take the, the security of the building seriously, and as convener, um, um, I would uh, like to let you know uh, our contingency plans. CSI staff uh, serves uh, as a responsible safety officer. Um, in this case, it will be me, and you will have to follow my instructions. <coughs> um, and as you can see, there are emergency exits back there. Now let me turn to our distinguished uh, visitor. Um, uh, Julie Bishop is the Minister for Foreign Affairs in Australia's federal coalition government. She was the first high-level speaker in this new building when we opened it, and we're delighted to have her back. Um, she's the Deputy Leader for the Liberal Party and has served as the member for Curtin in Western Australia uh, in the House of Representatives since 1998. She was sworn in as Australia's first female foreign minister um, on 18 September 2013, after four years in the role of Shadow uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade. She has served in the Howard Cabinet in government as the Cabinet Minister for Education, Science and Training, as the Minister assisting the Prime Minister for Women's Issues, and before this, Minister Bishop was Minister for Aging. Uh, she's uh, trained uh, as an attorney, uh, was a commercial litigator before joining, before joining politics, <clears throat> um, and uh, graduated with a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Adelaide uh, and uh, Harvard Business School. Um, we're going to hear from the Foreign Minister um, she's uh, here uh, in the United States for the um, OSMIN, which just concluded in Boston, our high-level um, security and foreign policy consultation. <clears throat> um, and after the speech, we'll have a short dialogue up here, and then we'll turn it over to you in the audience for questions. So please join me in welcoming uh, back to CSIS Foreign Minister Julie Bishop. Well, thank you, Mark, and good afternoon. I'm pleased to be back here at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Uh, this is my ninth visit to the United States since becoming Foreign Minister just over two years ago. And on each occasion, I'm enthused and energised by the power of the United States and the dynamism of our bilateral relationship. Over the past two years, I've been fortunate to meet with some of the brightest minds in the United States. On this visit, I've spoken with the foreign policy and international relations experts at the RAND Corporation, the Asia Foundation, Stanford University, Harvard University, and together with my colleague, Defence Minister Maurice Payne, with Secretary of State John Kerry, Secretary of Defence Ash Carter, at Osmin in Boston yesterday, which was a very successful ministerial dialogue. I've met with some of the leading innovators, Twitter and Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, Palantir, and some up and comers like Planet Labs and those with a distinctly Australian flavour, Cloud Peeps, Nitro, Kaggle, and others in Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. Today, I will bring two themes together foreign policy and innovation, and talk about what the future holds for the global order and what this means for Australia and the United States. In coming to office last month, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull set a vision for Australia's future. He said, the Australia of the future has to be a nation that is agile, that is innovative, that is creative. We cannot be defensive. We cannot future-proof ourselves. We have to recognise that the disruption that we see driven by the technology, the volatility and change, is our friend if we are agile and smart enough to take advantage of it. There's never been a more exciting time to be alive than today, and there's never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. These are optimistic, uplifting words. I believe that to more efficiently embrace the future, we need to anticipate coming events, although predicting the future is a brave endeavour. As the late, dearly beloved Yogi Berra said so well, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. Nevertheless, in 2015, we can discern some of the trends that are likely to shape the world in years to come. 
Esteemed organisations like the National Intelligence Council make significant contributions in this regard. To take a long-term approach, let's look ahead towards mid-century, where current projections reveal the world will be populated by almost 10 billion people, two-thirds of whom, that is somewhere near our current global population, will live in cities. Increased migration will see more people living outside their country of birth in more multicultural societies. A greater proportion of the world's population, an extra three billion people, most of them in Asia, will be middle class thanks to economic growth and development, improved education, health care and greater gender equality. It will be a wealthier world. The global economy will have nearly tripled in size. Countries will be even more economically interdependent than they are now while engaging in greater strategic competition. Looming resource scarcity and our contemporary understanding of the fragility of the environment will drive fundamental changes in production, making manufacturing processes and consumer goods more energy and water efficient. We can assume that disruptive technologies will continue to change our lives and our work. I have my hopes pinned on teleportation. <laughs> Governments will continue to come and go, yet I believe the nation state will endure. Global governance is likely to continue to evolve. That will apply domestically and internationally. And this raises the question of how countries like Australia and the United States will seize the opportunities and meet the challenges of the future. It's self-evident that the answer will depend in large part on the choices we make today and in coming years. These choices are now more vital than in times past, for I believe we are living through a critical inflection point in history. Since the end of the Second World War, international politics has played out within a global order unlike any that preceded it. By global order, I mean both the unwritten understanding and the written rules between states about how the international system functions and how nation states relate to one another within that system. For 70 years, the most powerful nation on earth has carried the unique distinction for a superpower of seeing its own national interest as lying in the promotion of public goods and the development of a peaceful rules-based global order where states voluntarily limit the exercise of their power for the common good. The last time the global order faced an inflection point was at the end of the Cold War. The academic literature of the late 80, 1980s and early 1990s examining what that signified had stu two standout thinkers, well known to any Washington audience, Francis Fukuyama and Samuel Huntington. In 1989, Fukuyama declared in his famous essay, The End of History, that we had reached, quote, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. Fukuyama claimed that the idea of liberal democracy had triumphed. All that remained was the passage of time as nations adopted the triumphant ideology. A few years later, Huntington wrote his seminal essay on what was to come in the post-Cold War period, The Clash of Civilizations. While both are outstanding works, it was not possible for either to establish a framework for analysing the dynamics and developments of the international system that followed. Unfortunately, we aren't seeing a widespread move towards liberal democracy across the globe. Freedom House has found that quote, acceptance of democracy as the world's dominant form of government and of an international system built on democratic ideals is under greater threat than at any other point in the last 25 years. For example, China has continued to follow its own path of a regulated market economy under a one-party system, while non-democratic nationalist and religious ideologies elsewhere in the world have proved more durable than desirable. Fukuyama's argument that there is no alternative ideology to liberal democracy that supports individual liberty holds true, but some of its old competitors have proved resilient. Huntington placed strong emphasis on cultural and historical factors downplaying the complexity of identity. 
Conflict over the past few years has had many cultural and historical elements, but cannot be explained by these factors alone. Some commentators point to the rise of anti-Western Islamic terrorism as proof of Huntington's thesis. However, the conflict in Syria and Iraq today cannot be characterised as between the Islamic world and the West. While the conflict began as a civil war in Syria, it has evolved and can now be described as an extreme minority group of one Islamic sect waging war against the rest of Islam and the rest of the world at large. There is a coalition of states from many regions and cultures united in wanting to stop the bloodshed and defeat the terrorists. In the end, notwithstanding the contributions made by Fukuyama and Huntington, the inflection point of the late 1980s and early 1990s represented a period of consolidation of our global order, not its transformation. When we look back at this current inflection point, will we be able to say the same? For we are living through a period of fundamental challenge to the global order. We applauded the use of social media to mobilise against repressive regimes in the Arab Spring, and technology will continue to play an important role through disruption. Today, terror networks are also using technology, but to recruit and radicalise across the globe. Fundamental shifts in power are underway, and I point to the two trends identified by Professor Joseph Nye. First, the shift of power within the global order, that is, the transition of the power balances among states, and second, the shift of power away from the nation state, that is, the diffusion of power to non-state actors and individuals. I was fortunate to have dinner with Joe Nye last night, so I could test his theories, and his new work, Is the American Century Over?, makes for compelling reading. Um, his answer, by the way, is no, it's not. In terms of the first trend, it is clear that power is moving east to the Indo-Pacific. The economic rise of Asia is being followed by its increasing strategic importance, military might, and to varying degrees, soft power. By mid-century, China, India, and Indonesia, and hopefully also a unified Korea, will join Japan as an established global powers. At the same time, relative power elsewhere is declining. To be clear, I am not referring to the United States. This country will still be a global leader in the foreseeable future, and I agree with Professor Nye's assessment that the United States is still likely to be in the lead until at least the 2040s and beyond. It will remain the most significant economy. Purchasing power parity is not the equivalent measure of per capita GDP. However, some powers are in decline, and notwithstanding President Putin's more recent assertive displays, I would put Russia in this category. It is certainly a lesser player than was the Soviet Union, considering that Russia's share of the global economy today is 1.6%, making it the 15th largest economy compared to the USSR, which accounted for 7.7% .7 in 1980, the fourth largest economy. What this transition of power to a more multipolar world means depends to a large degree on the behaviour of states as they compete for relative power. Russia's annexation of territory, military incursions and support for separatist movements has flouted the principle of state sovereignty. China's behaviour has been more nuanced. It has sought to make a space for itself in the international system that is commensurate with its economic and strategic weight. China is seeking a greater role in many existing forums and where it finds them unaccommodating, it now has the influence and economic heft to create new arrangements. On one hand, China's reclamations in the South China Sea has ignored sensitivities in the neighbourhood and escalated regional tensions. On the other hand, China has established new institutions like the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, to fill the gap in development finance and has begun playing a bigger role in global peacekeeping. At the UN General Assembly Leaders Week this year, China announced a 10-year US $1 billion China-UN Peace and Development Fund that it will join the Capability Readiness System and that it is setting up a permanent peacekeeping police squad and building a peacekeeping standby force of 8,000 troops. 
both are potentially valuable contributions to peace and prosperity that should strengthen the global order. The second shift in power is its diffusion away from nation states. Terrorism is one of the forces that sap power from states. The most overt threat is currently Daesh. It completely rejects the current global order and all of its tenets, even the nation state itself, having effectively erased the border between Syria and Iraq in favour of its proclaimed caliphate that respects no boundaries, no sovereignty. More broadly, power and influence is also increasingly vested in the hands of individuals and other parts of civil society, with technology the most important enabler. By the middle of this century, this will have brought about fundamental changes in the relationship between the state and its citizens. The individual attachment to the state will have eroded to some degree as individuals define their identities less in reference to their nationality and alternative centres of influence and authority emerge. This trend isn't necessarily negative. Modern empowerment has been transformational for many lives. Looking ahead, the globalised nature of the world will have further reduced the ability of states to quarantine issues, trends and threats. Events overseas will increasingly influence developments at home. In many ways, national borders will no longer be physical. A larger share of the transmission of ideas and trade and financial flows will take place outside state control. Perhaps even more so than today, wealthy individuals, NGOs and multinational corporations will control budgets larger than many states. It will be a world where nation states remain the locus of power but will have less capacity to advance their national interests even as they face increasing demands. These trends don't spell the end of the current global order, but they will change it, potentially quite radically. However, it will survive, but that will depend on whether it can adapt, on how effective states are in actively defending the useful and good parts of the global order while moulding the parts that need to change. The health of the global order is crucial for all of us, including countries like Australia and the United States, because it underpins our efforts to create a future framework that is supportive of our values and where we can promote our national interests. For decades, we have enjoyed relative stability underwritten by the United States military dominance that has deterred other states from destabilizing behavior and by international rules that afford a degree of certainty. We have enjoyed greater prosperity as the global order has facilitated a more open, free and secure trading system. We have benefited from cooperation on transnational issues, multilateral negotiations and projects that promote development and help manage threats like climate change, transnational crime, terrorism and pandemics. Crucially, for states like Australia, the current global order has provided us with avenues of influence. Its structure and norms have enabled us to drive international law like the Arms Trade Treaty, pursue initiatives such as Australia's lead on the UN Security Council's response to the downing of Malaysian Airlines MH17, to form coalitions that amplify our influence as we have in working with the MICTA group, Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey and Australia on the Sustainable Development Goals. That's why I've announced our candidacy for the Human Rights Council in 2017 and the UN Security Council in 2029. If we want to ensure that existing structures work as intended, we need to participate and support them. It is not a perfect global order. Often it is unequal, slow and inflexible, but it has on the whole served the world well. I should stress it's not an arrangement that Australia has taken for granted as being the responsibility of others, nor have we passively watched it evolve from afar. We have made commitments that anticipate burden sharing as an ally, to active participation in the global debates structuring international organisations, to outcomes which we have judged as advancing successfully for all and the democratic principles that underpin our society. Our task now is to guide the changes that are coming. And I believe we can make this inflection point one of simultaneous transformation 
and consolidation. The global order is, after all, a construct, a device created by states that can be maintained and refashioned by states. It has to be updated to take into account the realities of the 21st century, to accommodate the legitimate interests of emerging powers and a global citizenry that increasingly defines itself outside of states' borders, while retaining the features of the global order that derive legitimacy from universal appeal. This is no mean feat. We need to be agile to respond to change, flexible to accommodate it, and also resilient in protecting and promoting our values and interests in the face of change. When states like Russia violate principles of sovereignty or international law, the international community has to respond in defence of those principles, as we've done with the current suite of sanctions. We have to be clever about the rise of China. We have to accept it will not be a power in our own image and focus on cooperation where we do see convergence, like market liberalisation and regional stability through forums such as APEC and the East Asia Summit, so the global order can accommodate China's weight. Little noticed, but of enormous significance, was the undertaking given by the Chinese to the Americans during President Xi's recent visit to incorporate the sorts of governance principles which have emerged through years of work, trial and error, in institutions like the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank. As Australia approached membership of the AIIB, we worked very hard to see this trend emerge in Chinese policy. We were delighted to see there just may have been some impact. It is important for our institutions to adapt to multiple, sometimes competing centres of power, otherwise they'll become obsolete as emerging powers look for alternatives. And in the meantime, we should leverage more nimble forums like the G20. We have to be determined in our fight against violent extremism and terrorism and maintain international resolve to defend the weak, preserving the global order's ability to respond to threats through collective action. States need to adapt to citizens' new aspirations and identities. This makes the democratic project more important than ever, and this makes our shared values and our shared principles more important than ever. While we cannot expect the global order will perpetuate our values, we should be confident in them and continue to pursue a foreign policy that is underpinned by them. Finally, we have to expect the unexpected. It's the events we haven't factored into our predictions that can do the most damage to the global order. A nuclear war, accelerated impacts of climate change or a global depression would derail the vision of the future I outlined at the outset. We aim for peace and prosperity, stability and security. Australia will work with a diverse range of partners to this end, including our closest ally, the United States, using forums like OSMIN to discuss issues and propose pragmatic and achievable steps towards our goals. As the adage goes, the only certainty in life is change. We know the future will not look like today. If our foreign policy doesn't acknowledge this, if it aligns to the status quo, stands in the way of evolution of the international system, fears technological innovation, change will happen in spite of us. Once we accept the future will be different, then we have to act to bring about the kind of change we want. The current global order has intrinsic value that we should actively seek to preserve and promote as beneficial to the international community. However, for it to endure, to continue to be effective and to continue to serve our interests, the global order also has to adapt. It must abandon structures and norms that no longer have contemporary relevance to allow for new ideas and institutions to develop in response to contemporary challenges and to reflect the reality of the contemporary spread of power. Agility is not a weakness. We approach issues from a well-founded national character of commitment to friends, allies, and a decent global order. We know from time to time a physical price has to be paid and a political and economic price always. Change must be identified as a challenge, not a threat. 
I am confident our two nations have the capacity to adapt. We also know that holding true to our core values, the values of a liberal democracy and egalitarianism, is a non-negotiable tenet of adoption and innovation. I look forward to working with my counterparts in the United States government to seek that better future for both our nations. Standing together, that future is assured. Thank you. Um, I think there are, are very, very few uh, foreign ministers who could come to Washington and give a speech that was so um, scholarly, comprehensive, but operational and specific, but above all, a speech that is directed to an audience that you know very, very well. Uh, you know uh, what we have in common. You know the strengths the American people have, and frankly, we need to be reminded of that from time to time, and so you're a good friend uh, uh, to the United States, and uh, it was a terrific presentation. I um, also want to briefly acknowledge um, some distinguished members of your delegation who have joined us, uh, Ambassador Kim Beasley, and I saw Secretary uh, Peter Varghese um, uh, join us as well, <clears throat> and also um, a shout out to some of the Georgetown University students who are here, uh, my students, who will have to manage or survive this world that you're describing uh, over the coming century. <clears throat> um, I want to ask one or two questions myself and then open it to the audience. Um, the, the world you're describing <clears throat> is a world that um, is complex in terms of conceiving and implementing a, a strategy uh, for, a, for a middle power, for a superpower. Uh, there's a distinctly 21st century component that knows no borders. Um, and you spoke of that quite eloquently in San Francisco before your uh, visit to Boston. <clears throat> there's a distinctly you know, Westphalian 19th century dimension to Asia, and particularly the rise of Chinese power. And there's now a pre-Westphalian medieval a dimension to what's happening with Daesh, the Islamic State in the Middle East. Um, very hard for any government to, to create a foreign policy that manages all of these. Um, I wanted to focus in specifically on the second, on the, on the, on the China problem. <clears throat> uh, at the Osman, uh, you and Secretary Kerry and your colleagues um, uh, sent some clear messages uh, to Beijing and the region about developments in the South China Sea. Um, and uh, the Chinese government sent some equally clear uh, messages of unhappiness that um, uh, Australia and America expressed their view in the first place. It seems to me this is a good example uh, to elaborate further on how you manage these global issues with China um, while dealing with these tough regional issues, um, where perhaps this kind of tension may be the new normal. Um, and if you could help us understand a bit more about how you think about managing this relationship do we have to be prepared for tension in the relationship if it's necessary um, while we're trying to build cooperation on these global issues uh, with Beijing? Thanks, Mark. There is always tension, as history shows, when emerging powers or re-emerging powers uh, seek to make space at the expense of existing powers or superpowers. And so what we're seeing with China has uh, occurred in the past um, from the earliest of times. Neither the United States nor Australia uh, takes a position on the competing territorial claims in the South China Sea, and there are a number of claimants. But what we're concerned about is maintaining the relative peace stability in the South China Sea. And from Australia's perspective, we have a direct national interest in peace and stability in the South China Sea because about two thirds of our trade goes through those waters and we uh, reach the rest of the world by flying through that airspace. So the fundamental principles of freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight are not just you know, rhetorical propositions, it really matters to Australia's national interest. So we don't take a position on the competing claims, and there are a number, they should be resolved um, through the rules-based order, through international law, the law of the sea. What we do concern ourselves with is behaviour that increases the regional tensions, that increases the uncertainty and the instability. And there's no doubt that the reclamation and construction work by China 
but not only China, it's fair to say, that reclamation and construction work leads to regional tensions. Australia and the United States are not the only countries that are raising this concern. I attended the East Asia Summit and the ASEAN Regional Forum in Kuala Lumpur recently, and virtually every one of the 27 or so states represented raised the South China Sea in one form or another, and most raised it in terms of their deep concerns about the activity there. I note with interest that during President Xi's visit to Washington, he said that China did not intend to militarise the Spratly Islands. Well, I'll take him at his word. And we hope that uh, by um, advocating a less, um, let me say, assertive approach, we will see the tensions dissolve and the parties work peacefully towards a resolution of some of these maritime and territorial disputes. But clearly, we should not be deterred from uh, raising our concerns, nor should we be deterred from asserting our right, and that is to the uh, freedom of our oceans, freedom of our skies. Australia, the United States and others have a right to assert that and should continue to do so. Uh, China understands the notion of sovereignty very well. And I think this is a conversation we'll continue to have with China, but not just bilaterally or trilaterally. This is a much broader issue. And there are some um, interesting points coming up. Uh, there is an arbitration underway between the Philippines and China that will make some observations about jurisdiction that will then, I think, lead to some a further debate and discussion about this issue. My point being, it's not just Australia and the United States who's concerned about the South China Sea. It's a regional issue. Indeed, it should be a global concern. The United Kingdom, Europeans, others have an interest in a stable, peaceful South China Sea. Thank you. Let me ask another Asia-specific question. <clears throat> um, something you didn't touch on in the speech in detail, but something you've talked about quite eloquently <clears throat> is the concept of an Indo-Pacific strategy or um, cooperative mechanism. <clears throat> it's beginning to get currency in this town, but there's a lot of debate about what exactly it means. Um, I think some people look at it as a way to build a set of countries around China's periphery. Others look at it as a space for cooperation. Um, it, it is getting more and more part of the dialogue in Washington. The Pacific commander, Harry Harris, talked about the Indo-Asia Pacific, so he gave it his own twist. <laughs> but it really originates out of Western Australia, That's I think. Right. And um, it has the merit for Western Australia that Western Australia is right in the middle of it. <laughs> But beyond that, can you tell us a bit more um, for, for a Washington audience, what, what does this Indo-Pacific concept mean and how would you operationalize it as an ally and in diplomacy? Well, I should point out that both Ambassador Beasley and I come from Perth in Western Australia and we consider that to be Australia's Indian Ocean capital city. Uh, so Australia is bounded by the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, much as the United States is by the Pacific and the Atlantic. So we see the Indian Ocean as being an important part of our world, uh, but not just in a geographic sense, it's also a state of mind. Uh, Perth and Western Australia is in the same time zone as um, much of the world's population. Uh, we have China to the north and India to the northwest. And the Indo-Pacific is a geographic term in the sense that it encompasses both oceans and the literal states of those oceans but it also encompasses uh, India. And I think that India is uh, one of those powers that must never be underestimated. And as the world's largest democracy and as an emerging um, economic power, uh, we have to be cognizant of the role that India can play, both in the region but globally. So it's a forward-looking strategy to refer to the Indo-Pacific as reflecting the reality of uh, contemporary power balances. Asia-Pacific refers to the post-Second World War dynamism of this region, but it's an, increasing, uh, an increasingly powerful region if one includes India and some of the um, states of the Indian Ocean in it. It's a useful 
way to think strategically about the future when you start rethinking maps and, and, and uh, centers of gravity. And I think it's one that will continue to be discussed uh, you know, not only here and in Canberra, but across the region, including in Japan. The last question I want to ask uh, as, a, as a Japan guy before turning it to the audience. <coughs> uh, Australia's relationship with Japan has been very good. Um, enviably good, frankly, mm -hmm. from an American perspective. Um, there are a lot of issues on the table, including the submarine cooperation and trilateral cooperation, the future regional architecture. Um, where do you see that relationship going, uh, particularly with a new prime minister uh, in Australia? Our relationship with Japan is unique in a number of ways. We commenced the deepest level of economic cooperation in 1957 with Japan at a time when other nations were not so embracing. And uh, much of our current wealth and prosperity has relied upon the um, growth of the Japanese economy and its need for Australian commodities. Let's face it, our um, iron ore industry would not exist had it not been for Japan's uh, growth um, throughout the 60s, 70s and beyond. And up until relatively recently, it was our largest two-way trading partner. Um, China, of course, is today because of China's growth and need for our iron ore and coal and, and, and other resources and energy. So Japan has been uh, an exceedingly important economic partner for us. And uh, this year we concluded a free trade agreement with Japan. And I think we were the first developed economy to do so. And much of that reflected our strong historic connection. Uh, Japan continues to be of enormous significance to us. And we have welcomed uh, Prime Minister Abe's um, more normalised defence posture as being um, part of Japan's contribution to regional and global security. We see Japan as a force for good in the world and we most certainly will continue to work very closely with Japan in, in so many areas of endeavour and indeed the uh, trilateral discussions that we have with the United States just underpins the importance of Japan. And I note, again, in reference to my previous answer, that Japan and India have a very healthy and strong relationship and connection, which perhaps um, goes against what one would see as India's traditional non-aligned position. There's obviously a very uh, close connection with Japan that's um, worth noting. Uh, so under Prime Minister Turnbull, he understands very clearly the importance of our relationship. There was a personal connection between Prime Minister Abe and former Prime Minister Abbott, there's no doubt about that. But our relationship with Japan transcends the personal friendships and is firmly rooted in our um, foreign and regional policies and our trade and investment ties. Great, thank you. Let me open it up. <coughs> um, please identify yourself. We have microphones and uh, we'll come around your way. Uh, Patrick, in the middle here, I think we have microphones. Patrick Cronin, Center for New American Security. Thank you so much for an outstanding set of comments. I want to ask about cyberspace, the cooperation that is ongoing between US and Australia, not just our governments, but our private sectors, and also what else we need to be doing. I just returned from Bangalore, very short story. Joe and I, part of the International Commission on Internet Governance, the good guys. Other side of the room in Bangalore, people working on the dark web, people looking at the threats, the destruction of data. You talked about teleportation. Well, we have teleportation of data, yeah. including the ability to destroy across these massive borders. What, what else can we do about this? Clearly, um, cyber is one of the frontiers where uh, the challenges are um, still um, to be adequately assessed. And as we depend so um, fundamentally on the free flow of information and ideas, yet also have this um, need for security and confidentiality. Uh, the um, dilemma about the um, cyberspace becomes more diabolical. We did note, however, during President Xi's visit to um, Washington that there seemed to be some um, movement in terms of a recognition that Chinese firms have engaged in unacceptable practices and that the Chinese government undertook to not knowingly be involved in um, commercial 
espionage, if I can put it that way, and I thought that that was a, um, a recognition of the fact that Chinese firms or people associated with Chinese firms have been undertaking unfair commercial practices or illegal commercial practices, and I note that China has indeed um, indicted uh, some of its um, citizens in that regard. So I think that's quite a breakthrough. Um, spending time in Silicon Valley is always a mind-blowing experience, <laughs> let's face it, when you meet with people who really are just out of college and yet they are doing some extraordinary things with breakthroughs that and just to hear them describe it is, is quite, uh, um, quite unnerving but exciting at the same time. So cyber as we know it is going to change a great deal. What we need to do is ensure that we have uh, some fundamental rules in place, uh, the kind of rules of engagement that one has um, militarily. We need rules of engagement in cyber. But as always, there will be um, state and non-state actors that don't abide by those rules. Um, it's a question of, I think, continuing to be ahead of the curve, whether it's in encryption or whether it's in security. And that's what the United States does so well. The United States uh, militarily will continue to be uh, the most powerful on earth because of your ability to innovate and to be um, ahead in terms of the, the great breakthroughs um, that keep your military um, the most powerful on earth. I think that will continue to be the case in cyber, to keep ahead of uh, the attacks, to keep ahead of the, um, or to be uh, able to defend what you have. You've got to be as innovative as you have been in the past and embrace it and apply it. In the frontier? <clears throat> Stanley Roth Boeing, welcome back to Washington, Hi, Minister. Um, the newish, I guess, how long you can say new, president of Indonesia is coming for a very important visit to Washington at the end of this month. And of course, your country follows Indonesia much more closely than we do at many different levels. How do you see the current situation in Indonesia in terms of stability, in terms of ability to manage the economy, or any of the other aspects you might want to comment on? I hope that uh, President Widodo's visit here is an opportunity for the United States and Indonesia to deepen and strengthen the relationship uh, because uh, Indonesia is an important nation to us. It's um, a moderate Muslim democracy of some 245 million people just to our north. Um, President Widodo's focus has been unapologetically uh, domestic, uh, but there have been some, um, some instances of more nationalistic behaviour and more protectionist behaviour by uh, the administration than perhaps uh, we had expected. And so here's an opportunity for the United States to impress upon President Widodo uh, the benefits of uh, open, liberal, democratic values, engaging in the global order. Indeed, in recent weeks, I was heartened to hear Foreign Minister Retno Masudi talk about the role that she saw Indonesia could play in countering violent extremism and uh, acting in coalition with others to defeat terrorism. Because it is um, a moderate Muslim democracy, it can counter the narrative that uh, others might be attracted to. And so I think that that's another positive role that Indonesia can play, and I'm assuming that uh, the United States will use the opportunity of President, uh, President Widodo's visit to talk about what more uh, we can do to engage Indonesia in the coalition against terrorism. Um, we know that there are a significant number of foreign terrorist fighters from Indonesia, as there are from Australia, who are fighting with Daesh and al Nusra and others in Syria and Iraq. Um, we, of course, are concerned about their return to the region. We're also concerned by the number of um, prisoners convicted for terrorism-related offences in Indonesia who will be released in coming months and years. And uh, we need to work together on the rehabilitation of people convicted of terrorism-related offences, just as we need to continue to work closely with Indonesia on counting terrorism in all its forms in our part of the world. And uh, we hope that uh, the United States will be able to engage Indonesia in these areas as we have sought to do. 
Let me briefly follow up if I could. You know, in, in August 1945, there were two democracies on the other side of the Pacific from us, Australia and New Zealand. And we've had successive waves of democratization. And one reason I think people can take um, great encouragement from your vision is that there are so many um, you know, middle powers and the rising powers that, are, that, are, that have successfully moved in the direction of democratization. <clears throat> um, but right now, in your immediate neighborhood, there are also a lot of states that are struggling. Thailand, obviously. Myanmar. You know, Myanmar. Yeah. Uh, Malaysia's got you know, enormous political difficulties. You know, how does Australia and how do we play that? On the one hand, we're in a game of influence with Beijing. And some people are loath to ask too much in terms of democracy or human rights or women's empowerment. On the other hand, that's sort of why we have the strong hand we have for the future you describe. How do we, how do we together work that issue? Well, I take heart from Indonesia's transition to democracy. It's not been easy um, for them, but they have um, held successful elections and it is a robust democracy. It has its challenges. Uh, the geographic makeup of Indonesia presents enormous challenges um, for a start, uh, but uh, they're persevering. In Thailand, we've seen a setback. Um, the, the transition to democracy is not clear. Uh, in Myanmar, um, the news that they may well be postponing their elections in November is, is troubling. And what we need to do as, as nations that support these ASEAN countries is to continue to give them the kind of guidance, the kind of support. Uh, there's no point hectoring or lecturing. We, um, I think, influence by our experience and, and show what um, democratic values have done for our nations and that uh, we have relative uh, peace, stability and prosperity as a result of being open, liberal democracies committed to freedoms and the rule of law and democratic institutions and open export-oriented market economies. I mean, that's what has made us the countries we are today and if, um, if that can be a source of influence and inspiration then we should continue to advocate loudly in every forum that that's what can occur. But clearly, uh, these nations require support um, and, it, and an acknowledgement that it can't be easy for them, but we must persevere. Thank you. Yes, sir. <clears throat> There's a microphone coming. Thank you, Minister, for the fascinating speech. Uh, in the speech, you mentioned that there, in our global governance, there, is, uh, there are some structures and norms that have become obsolete and we should get rid of. Can you elaborate and give some specific examples? Could you Thank identify you. yourself for the minister also? You, uh, uh, who are you? Can uh, you identify my name is uh, Thiem Bui. I'm from Vietnam, but I'm now a fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Thank you. <clears throat> well, given that we've just had a uh, week in the United Nations, uh, the issue of um, UN reform is always uh, on the agenda. The, um, the use of the veto in the UN Security Council is a, an issue that exercises many minds. Um, we've obviously just had a, an experience with Russia's use of the veto in uh, preventing the establishment of an international criminal tribunal to pursue the perpetrators of the atrocity that was the bringing down of Malaysian Airlines MH17, a commercial aircraft in uh, open skies being shot down uh, in eastern Ukraine, yet we've not been able to uh, establish a tribunal um, because no prosecuting authority currently exists to receive the evidence that's been gathered through the criminal investigation. So that's an example where the um, use of the veto uh, is frustrating to a point where um, something will have to give at some point. I mean, using a veto in circumstances where humanitarian crises or uh, war crimes or whatever are being committed um, is something that we should consider. Also, I think the emergence of the AIIB um, is an indication where there were um, aspects of the um, global financial institutions that were wanting and an inability or um, refusal to change to adapt contemporary circumstances means that other structures will emerge. So I think there are some examples. Also, the um, emerging alliances, um, BRICS is one example, um, even not in the same league, but even MICTA, our uh, grouping of Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, Turkey, Australia, at first blush doesn't seem to make sense, but the more we get together, the more the foreign ministers of these five countries meet, 
the more we find we have in common and the more we can um, advocate common positions that actually uh, makes a difference. So it's a, it's a matter of being prepared to um, call out what's not working and what is disadvantaging peace and prosperity and being prepared to look for other alternatives. Not to throw everything away by any means, that wasn't um, any suggestion uh, made by me, but most certainly be prepared to adapt to the changing, the changing relativities, particularly of the power balances. Yes, sir. In the front. He's gonna... All the way in the front, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm former Congressman Marty Rousseau from Illinois, and I was just wondering, is the American pivot working like it was, start, was supposed to? Is it stalled? Is it moving? Are you happy with the pace that's going on with the American pivot? Of the pivot. Of the pivot. Uh, well, the uh, rebalance, as we call it, uh, was very welcomed in Australia. We have seen the, um, the defence posture of the United States include uh, the presence of Marines in uh, Darwin in uh, north of Australia. Um, We've seen aircraft uh, now being deployed, in US aircraft being deployed in Australia, and I think we're reaching phase three of the, uh, of the rebalance insofar as it affects Australia in the presence of uh, US military. What is exciting is the Trans-Pacific Partnership because that is the economic manifestation of the rebalance. And I certainly pay credit to the United States negotiators for concluding, along with Australia, uh, the TPP, we think this is a milestone in terms of um, liberalising trade for the benefit of the member nations, the 12 countries that make up the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It certainly underscores uh, US economic influence in the region, um, given the countries involved, and that includes Japan, Singapore and others. Uh, and so we see that the the twin pillars of the rebalance, that is the military presence where uh, the United States is supporting other nations in the region. And as I've said so many times, the countries that I speak to in the Asia Pacific want to see more US leadership, not less, in the region. And then the um, economic pillar of the TPP have now come together and are on the brink of being a reality. You may see some criticism of the pivot in the upcoming presidential election, but if there is any criticism, it's going to be that we should do more, not less. <laughs> so I think uh, well, there's there a bipartisanship some... around the direction that, we've, uh, that we're heading in. Yeah, there are some interesting <clears throat> positions being taken there at are... present, but I put <laughs> it in the context of, uh, <laughs> I put it in the context of the, um, uh, the race to the candidacy. Yeah, in spite of our democratic politics, small d, <laughs> we will, I think, probably get this done. All right, we have time for one last question. Yes, ma'am. Eileen Pennington with the Asia Foundation. Thank you so much for your excellent remarks. I wonder if you could speak, you've spoken very eloquently about shifts of power. And of course, another one that you have spoken quite a bit about is gender equality. And we noted with a great deal of appreciation DFAT's commitment to making sure that 80% of its aid investments will promote gender equality effectively. I wonder if you could speak to the importance of that target and what role you see gender equality playing in the world order. Thank you. Australia is a significant, if not the most significant, uh, donor of overseas development assistance and aid in the Pacific, for example. And so we have uh, set a number of goals for our aid budget uh, that includes um, embracing the private sector, embracing innovation, uh, focusing on our region. But one of the uh, pillars of our aid budget, innovation, is uh, gender equality. And by that we mean the economic empowerment of women and girls. So we set ourselves a target that 80% of our um, aid budget would, uh, would go towards the empowerment of women in some form or another. And I'm sure we're on uh, track to achieve that because empowering women and girls is not just the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do. And the economies of our region will not flourish unless they are able to harness the talent and creativity and productivity of, of half their population. And that applies across the globe, but um, 
most certainly in our region. So we have specific programs that address probably uh, three um, specific areas uh, of gender equality. The first is leadership, encouraging and empowering women to be leaders in their families, in their villages, in their uh, communities, in their um, levels of government at all levels. Um, we're also empowering women economically, giving them the tools to uh, take part in the uh, formal labour market, to start businesses, uh, to be more enterprising, and uh, particularly to uh, nurture small and medium enterprises where so many people can be employed. And we've been involved in a number of terrific partnerships with the uh, private sector, with um, some of our banking institutions to ensure that uh, microfinance can work, with insurers, for example, to, in, to ensure crops of, um, that are businesses that are run by women uh, and um, a whole range of different uh, ways of giving women access to resources and land and, and um, that kind of empowerment. And third, um, one which is challenging but has to be said and has to be confronted and that is violence against women, um, domestic violence against women, um, violence against women in conflict and women being used as, um, as uh, tools of war. So in these areas um, across the globe, but also in our, our own region, we hope to be a leader with other nations who share these ideals. It's not always easy. Um, where we're operating is in some other uh, regions of the world. We're in Afghanistan. We have a significant uh, women's empowerment program in Afghanistan and other countries. We are seeing results, but there are sensitivities around a lot of what we do, but um, we persevere. And I believe that um, when uh, women's voices are heard in corridors of power and around uh, our region, then we will truly see some breakthroughs in peace, prosperity and stability. And that's why our aid program is so specifically focused on it. That's my wife, by the way. And as our... Uh, no wonder you got the last question. <laughs> As our five-year-old daughter tells our eight-year-old son, I'm in charge. <laughs> uh, the economic modeling, the conflict resolutions research all shows you're right. And Japan, for example, is now embracing womenomics. Um, the, the countries we're talking about will be much stronger for the work Australia is doing and the US to, to, to make this a reality. Uh, Minister, you've, you've, you've raised our game here in Washington. It's a little chaotic and odd these days in this town, um, but you've really raised our game. So thank you so much for joining us again. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thanks.